but I'm still in sort of what I would consider my literature reviews phase, which is going to take several more years. I hope at the end of that process, I will be able to say, you know, here are the 20 best martial arts books. If you're interested, you know, for example, you want to know the, the real deal on Bruce Lee, read Matthew Pauly's biography. That's the best book out there. You want to know Taekwondo, read Alex Gillis. You want to know Shaolin Kung Fu, read Mer Shahar's Shaolin Monastery. Uh, that's, that's one of the things we're trying to do. Ladies and gentlemen, today I've got Richard Baitlich, and he's a really interesting guy because he's super interested in martial arts and martial arts history, which is a very easy sell for me. But he's also a cybersecurity expert. He's testified in front of Congress many times. He's uh, got a good view from what it's like to be, you know, the boots on the ground view, plus the view from 30,000 feet. So I think we're going to start with martial arts, Richard, and then go into, you know, warfare on a different plane. Sure. What's your background in the martial arts? Well, I was the type of kid who really wanted to do martial arts, but my parents said pick one activity. And so when I was a kid, I did scouting. Uh, I had a friend named Paul who was in karate. I always secretly envied his karate abilities. I, I, follow, I saw him fall backwards off a deck once and land on his feet. And I thought he must have some kind of special ninja training. But I didn't actually practice any form of martial arts until I uh, went to college at the uh, United States Air Force Academy. And in my first year there, um, we ha every, every cadet had to box. So we learned how to do how to do that. Uh, I also had to box intramurally uh, my sophomore year because I was the right person at the right weight in my squadron, and that was a disaster. Uh, <laughs> I did judo for uh, for PE one year. Uh, I I did on my own uh, or not on my own, but as a as a club activity, I did karate. And uh, all cadets also had to do a combatives class, which was the essential. You know, you're walking along and somebody jumps in your back, and you have to throw them, or mm -hmm. you know, that sort of street self-defense type thing that a lot of people end up saying that they studied, you know, military combatives and it. Honestly, it's just a few th uh, judo throws. <laughs> mm. I've always assumed that sort of run of the mill army boxing or air force boxing or Navy boxing is really just putting two guys in there, putting the gloves on and letting them swing for the fences. Is it actually more, te was it more technical than that? Or was it just like survival of the fittest and maybe you know what a jab is already? Uh, no, they do a good job of teaching you. Um, right. They have a philosophy there. And this is, you know, the Air Force Academy is essentially an outgrowth of West Point. Um, I graduated in 1994 to give you just a sense of the timing of the whole whole deal. Uh, they do teach you how to box properly. Mm -hmm. They have good instructors. Um, what you're describing is what happens when you get two of the newbies, throw them into the ring. It turns into just, uh, you know, as you could imagine, two brand new people trying to learn how to, how to fight, what that's like. Uh, the problem becomes when you get the Golden Glove boxers or the other kids who are going to fight in what's called the wing open, and you find out that you're just cannon fodder for those almost mm. professional level boxers. Uh, and that happened to me. You know, the, the, I can remember the first fight I had as a, a sophomore intramural boxing, and this kid who I later on, later on found out was you know the champ at his weight class or our weight class. And he was just toying with me for one round as a tune-up. And then in the second round, he just set me up and uh, hit me cleanly along the left temple. And I remember, well, what I was told was that I flew like at an angle through the air with my arms limp at my side. And the next thing I know, I woke up and there were already two fighters in the ring. And they said, get this guy out of here. He's, you know, he's been passed out for a minute or whatever. And it always bugged me that you took these people who ostensibly were there to become pilots, you know, 90% of the class was intended to become a pilot and you subjected their brains to yeah. CTE essentially. Uh, I wish I had known about, you know, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu back then. Um, it was pretty early for that, obviously. Uh, but that to me is a far superior way to instill toughness or self-defense or whatever you want to do through boxing uh, without inflicting the CTE potentially. Yeah. I mean, that's the great, I mean, we now know that for a martial art to be effective, you need to have some kind of pressure testing, some kind of sparring, some kind of training against resistance. And there are many martial arts that you can train that way. I mean, you can train stick fighting that way. You can train sword fighting that way. You can train grappling that way. And it's a tragedy that the striking arts necessitate brain damage as part of the learning process. So just even multiple small shots add up to... to to give brain damage. I mean, there's studies from soccer showing that players that head the ball more uh, have more problems with memory, right? They're not getting knocked out by a soccer ball. I'm sure it's happened sometime in the history of soccer, but in general, it's kind of unusual for a soccer player to head the ball and, and pass out. So they're not knockouts. They're not sort of 
concussions in the classical sense of the word, but it is subconcussive trauma that adds up over time. That's true. And just from my own perspective, uh, I studied several martial arts after my academy experience that were predominantly striking arts. However, with the exception maybe of a little bit of Taekwondo and a little bit of Kenpo Karate, very little sparring. So I don't feel like I accumulated that damage. Uh, when I did return to martial arts, like as a regular thing that I was doing quite a bit, um, uh, well, let's see, in 2016, uh, I, I returned to with Krav Maga, which, you know, essentially people aren't going to like this. Krav Maga is basically a combination of Aikido and American Kenpo Karate, I think. Sure. Uh, not, 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 um, historically, but stylistically, it basically is, I think. Um, I haven't done Aikido. I did do American Kempo Karate a while back. And that's what it reminds me of. Although the school that I trained at, we did have like just a straight up striking class where we would essentially kickbox. And mm -hmm. at the point where I was sort of getting tired of getting, you know, cause I'm not that very, I'm 5'9", 150 pounds. Uh, I would get mauled by the larger people in the class. And uh, right next door was uh, Pedro Sauer's uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu headquarters for you know his his federation where he would teach personally, and I thought I should go over there and try this out. I think I'm at the point where I'm ready to try that sort of thing, and I'm glad I did because it sort of changed the way I approach martial arts in general. Now I haven't trained in a year and a half due to COVID. I, I'm immunocompromised, and even though I'm triply vaccinated at this point, um, I'm not. And I'm uh, you know I'm not. I, I've just been through a uh, my fourth shoulder surgery. So I'm a little hesitant <laughs> to go yeah. back to jujitsu at this point, but uh, I will go back to something. I'm not sure what. Yeah. Thankfully, I live in an area where there's a lot of arts taught, so I will go back to something. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not only necessarily finding the right art. It's also finding the right training environment. I mean, there, there mm -hmm. might be a situation where, I don't know, you end up going to do Tai Chi, right? That's a pretty shoulder safe activity, mm -hmm. but you still get together with another person who's roughly your body weight and, you know, not... Uh, hopped up on steroids and not young, dumb and full of cum and uh, can actually train at a sane pace. So there may be a, a training situation as opposed to a style that that suits you to, to keep on training. And, and and if you're concerned, and I think rightly so, if you're immunocompromised about training, you know, it with the masses, then again, a, you know, a training partnership or a very, very small training group might might also suit uh, your needs. Yes. Yeah. You, you mentioned the sort of the training style. That's one of the aspects I really liked about uh, Pedro Sauer's school was that he's, I think he just turned 61 or maybe 62. And so he was doing all the greasy challenges when he first came to the United States. And, and he fought a lot of hard matches, some of which, you know, you can watch on YouTube. And so he constantly preached, you know, you got to play for the future. You don't want to end up like him where he has no cartilage in his shoulders and he has to get special therapies. And, uh, and so there was a core of, you know, older guys, I'll be 50 next month. And there were a core of older guys uh, and ladies even who would train not to kill each other. And that was great. Um, now the, the school closed during COVID and it's sort of broken into maybe three different groups uh, in different areas. So I'm going to probably check each one of those out and see what's happening with each one of them. Um, yeah, so we'll see. I'm hoping, I'm hoping to go back. Uh, I'm, I, it took me almost three years to get my blue belt. So I'm definitely in this for the long haul. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, I'm hoping I can, I can go back to something. Yeah. So where does the fascination with martial arts history come from? Cause I mean, that's, that's really how I, uh, came to know of you online. Yeah. I mean, you're, yeah. you clearly have a, a really good old book collection, which I'm jealous of because you've got some books that I don't. So don't ever invite me over for dinner. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> or at least always be in the library. Well, I also have, I should point out. Oh, I'm going to rub it in now. I have some new books oh, as well. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but yeah, the, the interest in history comes from my undergraduate years. I, I went to the Air Force Academy to become an astronaut and I expected, I, I, you know, I got a scholarship. Uh, well, Outside of the academy, I got scholarships for astronautical engineering, so learning how to design, design spaceships. Because, you know, the time when I was growing up, to be an astronaut was considered like the, uh, the, uh, the, the epitome of skill, you know, yeah. uh, all that stuff. Well, once I got to the, the academy and I had a really interesting first year history professor who told me that he was in military intelligence and he would pay attention to what the Soviet Union was doing. Remember, this is just before the Soviet Union fell. And I thought, wow, that sounds so interesting. And to tell you the truth, I'm not that interested in being an astronaut. Um, 
doing this whole military intelligence stuff sounds really cool. So I asked, well, how do you do that? And he said, well, become a history major. So that's basically what I did. I became a history major. I double majored in political science, uh, minored in German and French. Uh, because we we're going to fight the Germans and the French one day, right? No, just kidding. <laughs> uh, but, uh, <laughs> well, historically, uh, I mean, if the United States came from England and England was forever fighting at least the French, so and well, a there's of an issue now with the Germans too. Yeah, well, there's an issue now with the with the fisheries between the Brits and the and the French, and who knows what's going to happen with that. But uh, you know, f funny enough, the I found finally some uses for my two languages. Uh, I've been looking into um, the German Kriegspiel, the 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 simulation games that were basically the precursor to all like Dungeons and Dragons and all that kind of stuff. Well, Kriegspiel, they're German, right? They were the Prussian War yeah. Academy. They were learning how to play these games. They invented these games, basically. And so I've been looking at some of those original manuals. My German's not very good at all, but it, it helps, right? I can pick out some words. So you'll be looking French side, at like 18th, yeah, 1800s yeah. German. That's going to be even more difficult to read than normal German. It, it is. Yeah, I don't like I said, I can pick out a few words and I can say, you know, oh, Kriegspiel means war game, you know, that, that sort of thing. Is that um, like the but, sand, like the, the sand table gaming where like, okay, I've got an army coming around here and you've got four units over there and we're going to roll dice to find out who wins? Yes, they didn't roll. Well, actually, there's a great book I, I've just finished. It took me forever to read, like six months, but it was called Playing at the World. And it basically outlined how did we get to the point where there were role playing games. And so this guy went all the way back to like, how did chess evolve and what was before that? And and uh, yeah, so what you're talking about is exactly right. The, the Germans took it to a whole new level and they realized they could teach military officers. And this is, this is honestly another reason why I was interested in it was I have real concerns over how military officers are trained. Um, I'm not convinced the training I got as a Air Force Academy cadet was the best use of my time or, or you know, the fact that we march people around in formations that were used to mass firepower in the age of Frederick the Great in the 18th century uh, doesn't necessarily, I mean, he did that because it was military effective, militarily effective. I don't think it's militarily effective today. We know <laughs> you march soldiers in a mass, they're gonna get destroyed. But uh, yeah, but, uh, as far as going back to the, the languages, I have found a use now for my French, and that's um, there are many good judo resources in French because mm. uh, France is a judo superpower. So I actually have some French uh, judo books on the Waza and such that I can more or less read because my French is is a little bit better uh, than. Uh, but yeah, but as, as far as history goes, I, I'm like everyone else probably in the martial arts. You start out with an instructor who tells you that your art is five thousand years old if it's Chinese. Uh, probably if you're Korean, you're told your art is several thousand years old. Whatever your art is, it's several thousand years old because there is this, there's this tendency in the Asian cultures to equate the age of something with its quality. Mm -hmm. And so we all learn these myths. And many of these myths are repeated in books written by the old masters. You'll, you'll read many you know, Genshin Furukoshi books or whatever, and they'll repeat these myths. They'll say that, for example, jiu-jitsu is derived from Chen Guangping, who came to Japan from China, and he taught what became jujitsu, and it's all bunk. I mean, it's all. Uh, so I, I decided, although I can't personally become an expert in all of these different systems, all of these different histories, because it's just too broad, I at least wanted to find out who is saying something that is grounded in historical reality. There, there are sources, there are documents. You can go back and look at them yourself if you speak the, the language, or if not, you can read a translation and hopefully you, know, you have some faith in the translation. But what do we actually know about these arts? And it turns out most of them are at most several hundred years old. And in many ways, the historical documentation we have points to the European arts actually being older as we would recognize a martial art. I don't mean people in Europe were fighting earlier because people have been fighting, wrestling, yeah, throwing rocks at each other. But if you're thinking in terms of a codified set of skills that are taught with a rank and whatever, that type of thing is only a few hundred years old. And honestly, the, the real, actual, what most people think of as a martial art, wearing a gi, having a belt, possibly even doing a kata, that almost directly translates back to Kano Jiguro and Judo. Um, who, incidentally, the day we're recording this is his 161st birthday. So happy birthday. Happy uh, birthday, Dr. Kano. Well, let's just talk about that for a second. He's actually not a doctor. This uh, is repeated. honorary. They're giving out honorary doctorates to everybody. <laughs> I'm giving out an honorary doctorate to Kano. We'll, we'll, give, okay. we'll give one, yeah. But I did a blog post on that about um, there's, you know, he, he was a professor, definitely. Um, he was a, a principal. He, he was the principal of several schools. He was a member of parliament. Um, but he never completed anything that was equivalent to a, a PhD. So a doctor is more of some sort of a, 
uh, maybe it's a, a, a title that people use associated with him, but he, he didn't actually have a PhD. Yeah. Well, I mean, the term doctor has gotten, I, now I'm going on a tangent here. The number, you know, the amount of medical advice I've seen from in the last year from, you know, Dr. Smith, Dr. Smith says that vaccines will change your DNA. And then you look into it and best case scenario, the guy's a doctor of chiropractic. That's the mm -hmm. best case. But I've literally seen doctors, you know, PhDs of economics, mm -hmm. you know, pontificating as doctor, you know, doctor schmozzle. And, uh, you know, they're more than happy to let people believe that that doctor means MD. So, right. Well, uh, I'm a, I'm personally, I'm a failed PhD student. I, I did try to um, do a PhD in war studies at King's College London. Unfortunately, I was doing it while working full time and the PhD was full time. So that mm -hmm. failed. Um, but my goal is in a few years, hopefully after I uh, um, wrap up what I'm working on with cybersecurity, I would like to work on a PhD in history. And uh, at this point, my, I think my area of interest would be what's called the golden age and progressive era in the United States, which is, you know, people have different ideas, but it's roughly 1877 to say 1917. And it's sort of the birthplace for a lot of what became popular martial arts in the West. Mm -hmm. And so I think, uh, well, you see, you've seen, I guess, on my, one of my social media accounts, Martial Vitality, I like to post um, pictures from these early uh, martial arts manuals, basically from the first decade of, of the 1900s. And it's amazing some of the garbage that they post, as well as some of the stuff that is actually yeah. decent. Um, so I, that's that's sort of one of my my uh, main interests. Yeah. With regards to jujitsu history, have you read um, Robert Drysdale's Closed, uh, Closed Guard book? Yes, I have. Okay. I have definitely. Uh, and I very early actually uh, encouraged him to write that. Uh, we had a phone call because he, he was not interested in writing a book at all. And uh, I, I, not that I know him as a buddy or anything, but I managed to just secure a phone call with him. And I spoke to him and I said, you know, as a historian, I would be very interested if you would write a book because it's tough for a historian to cite a movie, you know, yeah. what, you know, tune into this movie at this date and time. And this is when this person said this, it's just yeah. a pain. So while I think his book is useful, I'm glad he wrote it. It's not a history as we would expect it. You know, it's a it's a resource on oral history that he collected, yeah. which is great. I'm glad we have it. But um, no one has written the definitive jujitsu history, in my opinion. And I've read yeah. Roberto Pedraira's books. Um, those are good, like source materials or or collections of source materials. Uh, we need a book that's of the equivalent so of the something Ro like Matthew Roberto Pedraira. That's the the three choke books. Yes, uh, and also now the three craze volumes. He oh, he just published. I've, yeah, I've not seen those. Yeah, he just published the third volume of Craze. Unfortunately, he only did it as a paperback, not as a Kindle. So I haven't bought it. <laughs> mm. And I talked to him and I said, "Would you please publish as a Kindle?" And he's too concerned about piracy. Uh, but as a as a paperback, it's not quite. I mean, it's not useless for me as a, as a as a researcher. But I do so much digitally to search things and highlight things and. Uh, pay, I try to really avoid the types of books you see on my bookshelf here these days. I almost do everything digitally. Okay, that's interesting. So if you're searching for a particular person or a particular date, you'll just type that date into your Kindle and let it find it? Yeah, so I use um, some software called Calibre, um, okay. C-A-L-I-B-R-E. And so I load all of my books into that. And so, for example, every time I have a, another project called Sourcing Bruce Lee. So it's just sourcingbrucelee.blogspot.com. And basically what I do there is every time I see a blog, uh, a Bruce, a so-called Bruce Lee quote, uh, I can usually tell whether it's real or not. Uh, and so uh, <laughs> He's I'll the Mark Twain of, uh, of martial arts. <laughs> yeah, or the Abraham Lincoln, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so what I'll do is I have not only the, the eight to find Bruce Lee library books that came out from Tuttle in the 1990s, I have about a dozen other books that are fairly well established as having a tie to Bruce Lee. Like he, mm -hmm. they're not just random collection, whatever they're, you know, something by the family, something by a researcher who tried to really look into it. And so, yeah, I'll, I'll use that as my first stopping point. I'll go to those 18 books or whatever it is. I'll put in a part of the quote. If I get a hit, I'll find out, Oh yeah, this is real. This isn't real. Um, so yeah, it's, it's invaluable for research to have the books in some kind of digital form. So I want to jump back. You were talking about how you know, uh, military traditions have preserved training methods from 200 years ago, right? At, at some point, it was advantageous to march around in great big squares and present, you know, uh, three rows of 200 men who are going to fire sequentially with their flintlocks or, or whatever. Yes. Um, 
And that necessitated certain kinds of tactics and certain kinds of training. And you still see that persisting now, right? I mean, what is drill? What is uh, honor guard marching? What is uh, what is marching, if not a preservation of that, which was once a cutting edge military technology and now is antiquated. And, and then we turn ourselves, we twist ourselves into knots to preserve this. Yes, we realize we're not going to fight like that, but it's still good for developing discipline or it's still good for this. It's still good for that. Yes. And uh, so I'll ask you a loaded question. Do you see any of this preservation of antiquated training methods in the martial arts? Oh, all the time. Uh, all the time. Thankfully, we have certain arts that are more associated with pressure testing. So the people who are more interested in combat effectiveness or even outside of, say, combat effectiveness, uh, you might consider you know, self-defense effectiveness, um, you have the opportunity to find those arts. Now, what I've come to realize, and I'm sure this is something you think about quite a bit as well, is that there are many people, I don't know what percentage of the martial arts community, it's probably a fairly large number, who are not con interested in martial or combat effectiveness at all. Um, you know, maybe I was more that way when I was younger, particularly when I was in the military, that was something I was interested in. Although again, in the Air Force, it's not like I'm getting dropped into a hot zone and I'm going to get fired upon and all that. Although I did have classmates who that happened to them and were shot down and, uh, you know, all those sorts of things. Uh, you know, we learned how to deal with those situations. Um, but for many people, they're simply there for fitness. They're there for community. And they really don't care if... Or a sense of tradition. Or a sense of tradition. Yeah, the, th that's what's so funny too. Like the uh, Japanese Koryu guys, they're so... They, they're so quick to put down the the, the new arts, the Budo arts, um, or, or, or the um, you know, Judo, things that came, you know, uh, Meiji Restoration and after, because they, they think that their art is somehow combat effective. And yet, what are they learning how to do? They're learning how to fight using methods and tactics that were appropriate, potentially, on the Japanese battlefield. There's actually been some interesting research recently that said that those arts as well they weren't necessarily even battlefield arts. They were more about developing character and everything. Because when you get down to it, there's only a few things you need to know how to do on a battlefield. And even when you know people say, oh, the art of the samurai, even at the heart of some of the worst samurai fighting that was involved, they were using weapons, you know, firearms. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> it, it's it's very interesting how people... And bows and arrows and spears. And so yes. people, uh, of the people practicing the traditional Japanese martial arts, weapons arts what percentage of the time are they larping with katana it's a i'm not saying that the katanas were never used but i mean if i'll give you a promise you and i are going to fight i'll take a katana or you get a choice of a three foot long katana or an eight foot long spear <laughs> and we're going to start apart which one are you going to pick of course you're going to pick the spear of course yeah like, that's right it, it, the reason that the katana became so important culturally from the research that i've read was that during the uh, the edo period you know the 1600s 1700s up through the meiji restoration 18 uh what so the period of relative peace period of relative peace yes there wasn't you know it wasn't complete peace but relative peace you weren't engaging in mass formation battles where you needed to f shoot firearms at each other or uh you have um infantrymen with spears or the samurai with their bows so you would be more likely walking around with your two samurai swords. And that's became, you know, that, that was when it became important to have uh, use of your sword. And then that idea of the sword being preeminent was projected backwards in time hmm. to be associated with previous forms of warfare. So now we have these images of samurai charging at each other across a field, waving their swords, when that wasn't necessarily the case at all. Uh, yeah, the, there's a whole concept of what's called invented tradition. Yeah. Um, that's a, so you probably heard the, the, the actual term. Yeah. Uh, and I think that happens quite a bit in uh, martial arts and other things that, that people enjoy. For sure. I mean, the reason Taekwondo has flying kicks is because we used it to knock the Mongols off of their horses when the Mongols invaded Korea. That's my, uh, okay. So now we've got a tradition of flying kicks. <laughs> Give me a break. You know, yeah. Like, yeah. Um, I think my first experience with that was when I read Alex Gillis's book, A Killing Art, which I think you've talked about on the show before. Um, when I read that book, I thought, wow, if this is, I, I accepted it as being true for Taekwondo, exactly what you said. And yet at the same time, the guys who were learning Taekwondo in the 50s and they fought in the Korean War, they were doing some really 
killer stuff. Like they actually were killing people hand to hand from what mm -hmm. I could read, but that's not what you learn in Taekwondo, uh, obviously. Um, or if you do, it's some sort of really watered down derivative version that has nothing to do with what those guys originally had to learn. So by reading that book, it made me realize that I would love to have that type of book for every art. You know, every art mm -hmm. should have a, here's the myth that you learn, and then here's the reality. And th th that really doesn't exist in two, you know, that yet. We don't really have that yet for BJJ. Um, we don't really have it for jujitsu. Um, there, there are, there is a great book that totally demolishes Ninja uh, by Stephen Turnbull called uh, "Unmasking the Myth." So he, that's my go-to book for anyone who you know thinks Ninja were real. Um, so yeah, there, that's what I would like to do is through the the Martial History Team project is to personally read, you know, seek out these books, read them determine whether they're useful or not, and then recommend them to people. And my goal at the end of the project, which you might consider, I mean, I don't see the project ending because people are always coming out with new resources, but I'm still in sort of what I would consider my literature reviews phase, which is going to take several more years. I hope at the end of that process, I will be able to say, you know, here are the 20 best martial arts books. If you're interested, you know, for example, you want to know the, the real deal on Bruce Lee, read Matthew Pauly's biography. That's the best book out there. You want to know Taekwondo, read Alex Gillis. You want to know Shaolin Kung Fu, read Mayor Shahar's Shaolin Monastery. Uh, that's that's one of the things we're trying to do. I'm still trying to get over you uh, saying that ninjas aren't real. <laughs> well, there is one back here somewhere you can't see. Uh, I'm sure this uh, someone... Uh... straight from the ninja parade. Well, <laughs> yeah. but let, let's take... I mean, obviously, ninjutsu is a pretty easy whipping boy, especially with the advent of video, where we can see some of the ludicrous stuff that is being promoted in the name of ninjutsu, you know, thanks to the work of, you know, McDojo Life and other people like that. Yes. It was a lot easier to believe in ninjutsu in the 80s, say, when all all you had was, you know, testimony, right? It had people testifying that uh, they'd met Hatsumi and that Hatsumi could had read their mind, picked their pocket, impregnated their girlfriend and defeated 10 men at the same time barehanded. Uh now when you see it, it, it looks kind of ridiculous. And it, I'm kind of ashamed to say, like, I would have given, <laughs> I would have given my left testicle to train ninjutsu when I was 15 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, and now it's like, I would give my left testicle to avoid training ninjutsu. <laughs> but, right. but so yeah, just take us through the ninja myth. Like I said, it's pretty easy whipping boy, but this is, this is fun for me. Yeah. Uh, so ninja is probably the best invented tradition uh, because it has been so thoroughly created by the uh, film industry and the TV industry. Uh, it's a phenomenon that arose mostly in the 20th century, thanks to, thanks to movies. And it, it has the curious effect of anything which seems to involve spying or assassination or stealthy movement, uh, gets projected backwards as being proof that, well, those were ninja who were doing that. Not that those were mm. skills that were taught to warriors like samurai, but that was a, the idea was, oh, that must be, have been a distinct class of people. And the fact that we can't find real evidence of it, well, that just shows how good they were at hiding their activities. Mm. Um, it bears many of the hallmarks of some of the conspiracies that you've talked about on the show and um, I'm aware of or heard of and investigated myself. Uh, but the thing about ninjutsu is that it's so attractive. You know, people love the idea of dressing up in that black outfit, of having the shuriken, of, I mean, I'll tell you that the first time, that one of the, I, I, I've heard, I can't quite tell if this is true. It may be true, but um, we know like one of the first depictions of the ninja in uh, Western film was in the James Bond movies. You only live twice. And, yeah. And I believe, I've, I've, I haven't been able to track this down, but I, I, from what I've heard, the first depiction of it in television was on the old Kung Fu TV show really? in like, a, okay. yeah, in like a season two, perhaps, which would have been like 1973, 74. When did uh, Shogun air? The that was James in the 80s. That, that was later. That was late 70s or early 80s, I think. Okay. Yeah. Um, but there's a scene in the movie where, or sorry, in, in this Kung Fu TV episode where there's a smith 
who is limping around and Kane can sense there's something weird about this guy. And then later in the episode, Kane is sitting, you know, he's, he's meditating or whatever. And he keeps looking behind him. He keeps looking behind him. And then he turns the third time and he sees a guy clad in the traditional ninja outfit walking, you know, stealthily coming down the road. And Kane looks at him and says, ninja. And that's supposedly the first time the word ninja was on American television, which, again, I'd like to find out if that was true. But, you know, it's old as 50 years old at this point. So who knows? It could be. And that, again, that complete, they're the black outfit. He had the secret weapons. He fired, the, you know, he threw the shuriken. It, the, the myth was complete at that point. Uh, everything you'd want was, was right there. So then how do we account for the proliferation of ninja associations, ninja schools, ninja seminars, ninja books? Uh, I guess Hatsumi is sort of the old guy uh, who's at the center of that. Did he just keep on fleshing out the myth? Did he like take his cues from television and as best as you can tell? I, so again, this isn't like my area of expertise and I would mm. definitely have people read Stephen Turnbull because he exhaustively goes through this linguistically, historically, documents, everything. He, he explains all of this stuff. But it seems like uh, it really sort of took on a life of its own in the media even with something like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which was a 1980s phenomenon. And what did we have after that? Um, if you wanted to attract children into your dojo, they were little ninjas. And you still see this today. I can drive yeah. down the street and see Little Ninja Camp signed up now. Uh, it's, it's such an attractive concept. That, that, and that's really the, what I've come to realize. It's is kind of people, funny how yeah. parents want to sign their kids up for... This this mythical assassination. I mean, I wanted to become a ninja. My mom took one look at it and goes like, poison, you know, throwing <laughs> stars, hiding in the shadows, climbing, jumping down, stabbing people in the back. No way. Yeah. And I can, in retrospect, although at the time I was furious, in retrospect, I can empathize with her or sympathize. But it's funny that people want to, it'd be like, I don't know, what, what the little assassins, right? Like what if you had, um, your karate school, you had your little assassins program. Uh, would would that do well financially? I don't think so. It wouldn't, but think about it. It has the it has all the great characteristics of a brand. If you think about mm. martial arts, what are the probably the three biggest brands? I would say Bruce Lee, Ninja, and Shaolin. Mm. And so all of those have a have a maybe ecosystem UFC around. as well. Oh, UFC, UFC now, yes. Like people want to go yeah. train at train UFC. Yes. But, I would agree. But, with that. That's more of an adult phenomenon, although Shaolin yeah. is as well. Um, the, yeah, the the ninja idea is it's it's sort of like a marine. You know, okay, we have soldiers and we have sailors. The Air Force, we don't really know what to call ourselves. We call ourselves airmen. Well, we're not really all men. We're there's women as well, air persons. So that is just a disaster. But the Marine, that has a real, like they've built a lot around that to be a Marine in the United States. Even other countries, if you're a Marine, that's, that's something very distinct. So Ninja has that as well, even though it's completely fake. But uh, it's, it's, a, it's an identifiable brand. And, and the, there are, you know, the Ego and uh, I can't remember the two regions in Japan. You know, they've gone full bore with this. They have museums. They have, you know, spend a night in a Ninja castle. Uh, it's become this big economic driver. And when you press them, that's what Turnbull does in his book. When you press them, you know, what are you basing this on? It's not really based on much of anything. Okay. Well, I, I would go spend a night in a ninja castle. I'd like, <laughs> I don't yeah, care. It's fun, right? I'd also go to, I mean, I, Disney World isn't high on my list of attractions, but if I do ever go visit Disney World, I don't actually think that there's a magic castle somewhere in the world. And I don't actually think that that, you know, uh, that I'm actually meeting Minnie Mouse or whatever. Well, I agree, and I would go visit the Millennium Falcon, and if I could spend a, you know, have a meal there or whatever, or I don't know what they do in the Millennium Falcon, you probably just walk through and you spend one minute, and you spend you know fifty dollars to see it. But I would do it, you know. Yeah. It's a, <laughs> it's such an interesting part of my childhood that uh, I could see how people get uh, interested in these sorts of things. Okay, well, let's pivot to the cybersecurity aspect of it because it's something I'm really interested in. Uh, you got into cybersecurity when you were with the Air Force, yes? Yes, yep, in uh, the late 90s. Uh, so what were you doing then? Like, Yeah, so I, I was, uh, after I graduated from the Air Force Academy, I went to graduate school for two years, um, and then I went to military intelligence school, which is almost a year training, and I learned how to become a traditional Air Force intelligence officer. And I did a little bit of that work. Um, I got involved a little bit with the... Uh, 
the wars that were happening in the Balkans back in the 90s, if anyone remembers that. But the unit I was stationed with was the Air Intelligence Agency, and the commander at the time was was General Michael Hayden, who later on became famous as the NSA and the, and the CIA, CIA director. And the coolest part of the building was the Air Force Computer Emergency Response Team. It, it was this part of the, the military uh, within the Information Warfare Center that always had this buzz about it. And I would take, one of my duties as a new lieutenant was to take people on tours. And so I would I would go through this unit and I would look at what they were doing and, and I just was fascinated by it. So uh, I was, at one point during my stay there, I was deployed overseas to the, to the UK to do some uh, targeting work. And I started to take classes at night at this, this uh, unit, uh, RAF Lakenheath. And I, I thought, okay, if I want to get into this unit, what do I have to know? I have, probably have to know how to program a little bit. I'm going to need to know some Unix system administration. And they all, they, all these classes were free, so I just took them at night. And when I came back to the unit, I said, I really want to transition into the AFSERT. And after about a year, my boss got me transitioned into that unit, which is a little iffy because I was an intelligence captain, which they didn't really like to have the intelligence part like formally associated with the AFSERT because... Uh, you know, there was concerns over surveillance and that, that type of thing. But on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, you know, the very first day I, I got there, I sat down between two analysts and I looked at the one on the left and I said, what are you doing? And, and he said, I'm watching a Chinese hacker break into an Air Force site. And I said, oh, that's interesting. And I turned to the young lady on my right and I said, what are you doing? And she said, I'm watching a Russian hacker break into an Air Force site. I said, oh, that's interesting. And so I so this just is started. The, this was in the 90s or early 2000s? No, this was in 19, this, this would have been September of 1998. Was okay, when I first so started it was a problem year. as far back as then. Oh, yeah, yeah. And if you want to see how far back it goes, um, probably the best open resource is a book by a guy named Cliff Stahl called uh, The Cuckoo's Egg, which is his civilian investigation of a uh, German hacking ring that was working for the Russians uh, in the 1980s and how he tracked them and caught them. And he basically invented the premise, the, the foundations of our of our field. And... Um, yeah, so that's it. And I, I was able to meet him a few years ago, which was wonderful, you know, to meet one of your childhood heroes, basically. But uh, yeah, so it, the thing about cybersecurity to realize is that as long as computers have been networked, people have been hacking each other. And initially it was sort of universities being targeted. And then the defense contractors who were connected with each other were targeted. And then it expanded to general government to government type activity. And then in the 2000s is when we saw the real rise of commercial hacking. So attacks uh, against general companies, more or less. And the uh, while the Russians were considered the best outside the United States, obviously, the Russians were considered the best and the stealthiest. Uh, the Chinese were everywhere. They were the uh, most ubiquitous. And so we spent both in the military and then later on in the um, private sector, I spent a lot of time dealing with Chinese hackers. And at one point, there was even a meme and a t-shirt circulating in the information security community that had a picture of my face, and it said it was China. Uh, and that was a joke. Uh, but it's since come to be realized that, yes, it was China quite a bit. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, we'll just take it as a given that you know what you're talking about. So when Chinese hackers or Russian hackers are trying to hack say the obviously if they're trying to hack a, a private website like they did for a friend of mine it's basically a ransom operation probably right where they shut everything down and then they say you know it's a quarter million dollars and hopefully you have insurance for that and the insurance company pays the hackers and the hackers go away but okay. what are they doing when they're attacking uh larger companies or what are they doing when they're attacking even government or military installations what's the yeah goal? Yeah, so there's there's many classes of these intruders, right? Um, the lower end people, well, that, that's not even true. I won't even say that. You've got higher high end people at all levels. But um, if you are a criminal hacker who is financially motivated, these days you're doing what you just described. You're doing the ransomware operations where you're extorting companies to the tunes of millions of dollars uh, up to the limits of their insurance um, liability or their insurance policy. Um, and the reason why they're able to get this is that they hack the insurers, they get a list of the insured clients with their policies, then they go out and hack all those those policyholders and say, look, we know your insurance policy is 10 million, pay us eight, pay us 5 million, we'll consider it even. 
and the companies pay because it's so difficult to recover from some of these these problems. But outside of that type of activity, which has been just the scourge of the internet for the last several years, and which just kills me because so many people are hurt by it and can't handle the consequences, you have all of the nation state hacking that occurs. And this is when we're talking about you know the top tier boys, you know the United States, um, the Russians, the Chinese, to a certain extent, the Israelis. Um, if you're a top tier nation, you do have some type of offensive capability, but as far as the act, you know the countries that are the most active, it's going to be you know the Chinese uh, above everyone else. They're just unbelievably active, and then you'll have you know the other nations in there. So what those companies, you know, what they're trying to do is at least for the Chinese, for example, uh, in addition to supporting sort of traditional intelligence operations where you're simply trying to know what your adversary knows about you and what their plans and intentions are, the Chinese have had a very extensive program to accelerate their economy, accelerate their military industrial complex, to leapfrog as much as possible technological backwardness that they suffered um, since the Great Leap Forward, and to inject all of that to bring themselves up to par and eventually surpass the Western powers, particularly the United States. So when I worked both with uh, defense contractors, for defense contractors, and um, saw what was being stolen, you know, it was jet engine technology, um, I, this is going to sound kind of weird. This is this is all public, though, at this point. Um, the formula for high-end paint, so that they could produce the whitest of white paints, things like that, like that was stolen from DuPont. Um, all of this stuff, they have this imma immense program that funnels this into their economy, whether it's to the private companies or to the def their defense contractors. And when I say private companies, nothing is really private in China these days. So essentially, it's uh, it's it's put into these organizations to try to get them at the level of the West and then eventually to uh, to surpass the West. So I'm a Chinese hacker. I'm sitting on my computer. Mm -hmm. I'm hacking away. Yep. Who pays me? And like, how am I tied into the... And, and I'm, I'm trying to hack the, the color white from DuPont. Right. Yeah. What's so there's my different... relationship to the state? What's my relationship to the end company, the, the Chinese paint company that ends up using that white paint formula? Yeah, there's different uh, groups available. There's uh, at the at the high end, you have the groups that are specifically, you know, you've got uniform wearing Chinese soldiers. Um, for example, the the unit we exposed, unit six one three nine eight, which we called APT one, uh, which was a People's Liberation Army unit that worked out of a specific building, and they were military, uh, you know, enlisted and officers. And they would receive taskings and go after various targets. So you've got that level. You've got the Ministry of State Security hackers, which again are specifically government associated. And what's got what's been kind of cool over the last several years in the United States, at least, is we have indicted many of these individuals. So you can learn about who they are and who they work for and whatever. Although we'll never catch them, I would say uh, it does help to know exactly who some of these people are. Now there is a reciprocal risk that they could do that just as easily to Western hackers, <laughs> uh, yeah. or not you know, Western, we'll call them information security professionals or operators. But uh, so you've got that whole ecosystem. There's a secondary level of people who are reservists or they're militia or they are state affiliated, but not necessarily state, uh, you know, supported uh, in the terms of like financially supported. There's a whole level of groups like that. And then you have uh, the patriotic hackers who are simply general ch Chinese citizens who who become infuriated, for example, when um, there is a collision between a Chinese plane and a United States plane in their territorial waters. And as a result of that, these patriotic hackers just decide to try to hack anyone they can or conduct, conduct denial of service attacks or, or whatever it is. Um, so you've got many different varieties of, uh, of hackers. Okay. And you, you were talking about sort of the hacking of uh, proprietary secrets to help aid Chinese industry. I'm imagining there must be a whole other level of, you know, trying to hack military secrets or, uh, or hack sort of political, uh, you know, records or yes. diplomatic records. Yeah. You've got everything you can imagine. So if you think about, you know, decades ago, before we had everything on the network, you had to conduct various forms of intelligence gathering using human operators and to a certain extent, um, signals collection, 
for example, like signals intelligence. So uh, if you had a rocket that was sent up, you might um, try to get some telemetry off of it or use radar or try to figure out how fast it was going. Uh, or else you had to recruit uh, a human who was associated with the program who might be able to pass you this, the, the uh, design or, or whatever. Or potentially, if you were in a conflict, say in the, in the Korean War, where we had we had a Korea, you know, a conflict between uh, North and South Korea, uh, but you had Russian pilots flying Russian planes with North Korean insignia, uh, with red Russian beards, fighting against American pilots, and the American pilot fires a missile that gets lodged into the tailpipe of the of the Russian, nay, you know, North Korean jet, and they land and they pull this missile out and they reverse engineer it. You know, the, these are all the ways that people would get their information uh, back in those days. But these days, with everything on the network. Um, even to the extent that it's air gapped, you know, it's on a it's on a secret, you know, quote unquote secret network. There are still ways you can get access to that sort of thing, whether it's um, through jumping through various networks or conducting uh, sort of remote collection. You know, we someone could be outside my house spying on the the contents of my screen using the appropriate equipment. Um, there's all sorts of of ways to do that. Okay, I, I want to get into some of those ways uh, and how to protect. You know. At a, at a gen, generic general level, how yeah. what the protection measures are. But first I have to ask, I mean, we've just been talking about the evil Chinese hackers and evil Russian hackers. It's probably naive to think that we're not doing the same thing. By we, I mean the West, the, you know, the UK, uh, the US, Canada even, uh, yeah. that we aren't conducting some sorts of uh, reciprocal operations and have been for some time. Yes. So every nation spies on everyone else. Um, even allies will spy on each other. And when that's discovered, people get very upset that it occurs. Um, the difference between what the West, and I'll say the West, say we'll use the five eyes as a good example, you know, US, UK, uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. The difference between, say, the five eyes and what the Chinese do is that the five eyes don't take what they've learned from industry, uh, say their targets, and pass it to their own native industries. So, for example, if an American, uh, let's say the NSA gathers some information from a, well, okay, th there's two distinctions here. First, uh, in general, the US, UK, like-minded countries don't target uh, private industry to the extent it's private, you know, in, in a place like China. So that's the first thing. They don't target it. And then secondly, if they do did come across some information that would be useful to a Western company, they don't then turn around and pass that information. So there's kind of a double layer of protection there. Um, that's not true for everyone. Uh, for example, the French and the Israelis are very, are they're known to have been active in going after various other targets and then passing what they learned to their domestic industries. So, you know, I, I had firsthand experience with this. I, when I was a, a captain at the AFCERT, I got a call from a very irate French person who was mad because we were blocking access to his French company to our one of the bases in Ohio. And he, while he was having this conversation with me, trying to convince me to let him have access, he was interacting with a gentleman off to the side who was speaking French and telling him what to do, what to say to me to convince me to take the action they wanted. What he didn't realize was I understood what he was saying because I spoke French. And so I called in my um, Office of Special Investigations officer. I called him over and said, I think this is an operation I, and I you know, told him what was happening. So we had this weird four-way conversation where the French spy was talking to his guy and then spoke to me and then I would ask my guy what to say. And so the French have been known to take what they learn and pass to, you know, if they steal something from Boeing, they may pa might pass it to their you know, domestic industry. Uh, but that's, it's again, uh, it's a question of degree. With the Chinese, their operations are so massive; it's just unbelievable. It's it's. Uh, how massive are they? Yeah. Right? How how many Chinese hackers are there right now? Oh, we're talking probably thousands, if not tens of thousands. That I'm talking state supported. It's okay. uh, it's really amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, now they're all not all go... experts. They're they're not all like sure. you know cyber ninjas. Um, many of them are simply following a script, and by that I mean like a literal playbook that tells them what to do, which can be the which which when a Western defender sees what they're doing and they get stuck and they keep trying to you know try the same thing over and over again, 
it can kind of be funny sometimes. And we used to have an internal briefing when I worked at Mandiant where we would go through some of the biggest you know, epic fails of the Chinese hacker community of the previous year. So I think some of that might even be public now. Um, but again, I, you don't really want to poke the bear because yeah. uh, they could think, oh, that's so... I bet you can't overcome this level of security. I bet you can't. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So that, I've always tried to be respectful to the other side because, uh, you know, I don't want to get, get targeted by them for, you know, for something that I say. or So I, I try to, you know, show them the proper respect. So what precautions do you take personally? I mean, you, you are, you know, you've mentioned the word China, you've mentioned the word Russia. Yeah. Uh, you've. You've said the quiet part out loud. So how, what are you doing to protect yourself? Um, so the things that I do and what I would recommend to everyone is to keep your devices up to date. So if you're using an iPhone, uh, make sure you keep the patch. The same thing with Android. The, the problem with Android is that whole ecosystem is very fragmented and broken, and it can be difficult to keep it up to date. Whereas with I, iOS, it's more monolithic, obviously. And... Um, they make it easier to keep things up to date. So that's the very first thing, is that if you keep your system up to date, uh, it is much more difficult for somebody to break in. It's not impossible. In fact, it happens all the time, but it does sort of raise the bar that they have to, the, the intruder has to really waste something valuable, you know, a, a so-called zero day perhaps, uh, in order to get into your system. So the first thing is just to keep everything patched. Um, the second thing is to use a reputable email provider. Um, I'm personally a fan of Gmail because they have a very good security team. They got religion about 11, 12 years ago now when they had a massive intrusion of their own and you know figured out what it was like to fight against Chinese hackers. And, and since then, they've invested heavily in the security of their own infrastructure and protecting their users. Um, so that's the second thing you can do. The third thing you can do is everywhere possible that you can in, uh, implement some type of second factor of authentication, do that. So uh, the, the best one that you could possibly have would be uh, a hardware token that's generally kind of overkill for most people, or it's kind of a pain for most people. It's so-called FIDO key. Uh, but um, just being, you know, just having an app on your phone that will tell you, you know, when trying to log in here, put in this code, that will help you tremendously. Um, I'm sorry, I, what do you mean by that? So I, yeah, I try so to log into, I don't know, Instagram. Yeah, yeah. So for Instagram, I believe I have that enabled on Instagram. You go to Instagram, you put in your username and password, and it says you must input your six-digit code. And I have on my phone an app that's generating those six-digit codes. I type in the code, and now you can't just get into my account because you know my username and password. You have to also have access to that code, and that's why there's so many scams that work people into, you know, forking over that code, uh, or potentially even if you do it via a text. Uh, potentially intercepting your text, which again, you know, that's another hurdle somebody's going to jump over. Um, the thing to realize like, when you're dealing with professionals is that against a professional, you will lose. Uh, professionals lose against other professionals. So if I had a really, you know, high-end Russian or Chinese team target me, I'm going to lose. Uh, but for almost everything else, there are things that you can do that will keep you um, fairly safe. And even, you know, things like don't click on links. You don't know where they, you know, you get some text don't click on the link. Um, you get some weird email, don't click on the link. Um, those are just you know simple things as well. What uh, what are the craziest things that, so let's say the, the, the Chinese decide to take you down. What are some of the craziest things they would do to get access to your, your, your phone, your computer, your systems? So the craziest thing in terms of sort of effort would be a close access operation. Um, typically though, you're gonna have to be in country for that because they're not going to generally operate on U.S. soil. They do have operatives here, but you know, you'd know you have to be like the Secretary of Defense or someone for them mm -hmm. to try to do a, a close access operation against a target that way. Uh, they're probably more likely to try to recruit you as a human asset than to, than to do some type of you know, technical attack on your systems. However, if you go to China, and there's many videos on the internet that show this sort of thing, you go to China and you leave your laptop in your room, um, there's a, you know, you're going to have cleaning people or potentially somebody coming in through the ceiling and they're going to open up your laptop, stick in a USB key, break into the system, grab everything they want off of it. Uh, same thing with your phone. You know, you're on, you're on the uh, Chinese cellular network. They're going to push an update down to your phone. Um, it's going to change the firmware and suddenly they control your phone as well. So if you travel to China and you at all are concerned about security, I would always recommend using a burner phone and a, a burner laptop or you know, whatever whatever equipment you take to China these days, consider it compromised when it comes back 
and may even be worthwhile giving to a security company to see what they could find on it. Uh, so yeah. who should be concerned <laughs> about this? If I'm Joe Tourist going to China, what are the odds of me getting hacked? If I'm like Joe Businessman going to, I don't know, going to a factory to see if they can make more luggage because I sell luggage, am yeah, I going to get you're... hacked? Oh. Yeah, if you're a business person, uh, you're probably going to get hacked. If you're a tourist, probably not. I mean, they have they have resource limitations like everyone else. But if you're in any type of industry that is on one of their uh, you know list of 20, 21 top industries, you're definitely going to get targeted. And it's someone like me. Uh, my wife and I. A lot of people wonder whether I'm like anti Chinese or something. My wife and I went to China for our honeymoon, so we uh, you know we're we're fans of the culture. I obviously fan of the, the martial arts as well. Um, but every city that my wife and I visited, we were, we were both two active duty intelligence officers at the time, every city that we were in, we were able to identify the handler who was there to watch us and they took pictures of us. And, you know, so that <laughs> it's just, a, it's just a fact of life going to China. I will not go back to China anytime soon. Uh, it's only gotten worse over there. Similarly, I will, I would love to visit Russia, but I, there's no way I would visit Russia, especially now when there's so such heightened tensions between our countries and those two countries, the, the possibility for the, you know, the hostage uh, diplomacy that they, they pursue, no way. Um, you know, I don't consider myself that important. I don't think, you know, I'm a target or anything, but the risk, <laughs> You see the people that they grab; um, it's just not worth it, in my opinion. So I'm, I'm yeah, hoping like two, for it. Some the two point Canadians the they grabbed after they gra after the uh, Canadian government ended up detaining the uh, the Samsung heiress. Uh, yeah, the uh, the Huawei, um, Huawei founder's daughter, sorry, the CFO, sorry, sorry. not Samsung. Yeah. Uh, and then all of a sudden, a couple of Canadians get grabbed and get uh, held in jail, basically without trial for yeah. three years, and get released. <laughs> Shortly at the two Michelles. Yeah, yeah, it's I, I, you know I love I would love to visit and see so much of that culture again, but it's just not worth it in my opinion at this point. I'm I'm hoping that we get more Western friendly um, governments in the future, and th that's just one other point to consider with all this. There is nothing about what the Chinese do with their economy that cannot be replicated anywhere else. You know, I don't see any reason why you couldn't have some of the rising countries in Africa, for example. Um, Nigeria is a great example. They have a gr they have a really strong underground criminal hacking community that could be repurposed and adopted to hack in the same way the Chinese did and to try to jumpstart their their industry. So this is a model that is easily exported. You mean the uh, the Nigerian prince uh, scam who's died and left you one hundred million dollars if you will just transfer five thousand dollars to for legal fees uh, that hasn't gone away completely. No, yeah, that's still there, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, those those people could easily be repurposed if they were taught a little bit better, taught some better trade craft, um, had a little bit better tooling. Um, it, that's the thing about cybersecurity is that the investment of human capital is very low. I mean, everyone's got a phone. Laptops are not that difficult to procure, and you have an internet connection. Suddenly. Uh, you know, if you're the person who is just simply connected to the internet, trying to surf the web or whatever, you're at the mercy of every maniac who's out there potentially. Um, so it, the asymmetry between the offense and the defense is is ridiculous, and it only favors the offense, and it has for for decades. And the reason is, in cybersecurity, no one playing the defense takes the offense off the field. Now, it, it, when you have a defensive, what do you mean? About, yeah. So when you play defensive warfare. Um, you don't just sit in your in your bunker and take it. I mean, you do, I guess, if you're like an Iraqi in the first Gulf War, you just get pounded by the B-52s and then you come out and you surrender. But if you're in, say, your castle and you're being attacked as the defender, what are you doing? You're shooting at all of the guys coming at you. If you're in your trenches, what are you doing? You're shooting at everyone that's coming at you. And you may get overrun, but not without taking down hundreds, thousands, potentially, of the of the enemy. In cybersecurity, we don't ever take the adversary out. I mean, yeah, there's some prosecutions that might occur here and there. But for the most part, every single defensive action you take is just waiting for that next one, you know, that next attack by the person who's out there who they only stop when they take a vacation or they retire. That's the real difference. So the the offense, uh, in, in addition to being, there's a whole bunch of other uh, advantages the offense has, but that's the biggest problem we have is that uh, the if people who try to compare cyber warfare to kinetic warfare in cyber warfare you never take out the adversary so they can just they're just free to continue attacking okay
I don't want to let you go without talking about the sort of the flip side of hacking. Hacking is trying to break into something to get something out. Uh, I think in the last couple of years, the proliferation of the crazy conspiracy theories that you've seen around COVID, around vaccination, around QAnon, around you know, just the wild proliferation of conspiracy theories. There have been people who've made pretty convincing arguments that this is in some part being fueled by the opposite of hacking, which is the Russians and the Chinese incepting ideas or, or fueling the division in society it's under the the argument that it's a lot cheaper to cause a society to rip itself apart than it is to go and actually fight it militarily. Yes. Uh, I know that's not your specialty, but what do you what do you think about that whole uh, that whole aspect of cyber warfare? Yeah. So when I first got into the field, it was called information warfare, and that and then it turned into the cyber part. Um, and now it's kind of come full circle and we realize this whole thing is about information again and there's a warfare component to it as well as an operations component to it and like you said that's what's happening is that those who are not in a position or it's just too difficult or too risky for them to challenge us directly uh you know with a plane or with a tank or whatever it's much better and much cheaper and in some cases even more effective to encourage us to tear ourselves apart um one of the things you can do, I think, is if you're worn, if you're wondering like what's going to happen next, take a look at the countries that are directly bordering some of these actors that you worry about. So, for example, North Korea versus South Korea. Um, the South Koreans are very good at tracking what the North Koreans do in their information operations. Uh, with Russia, you can look at um, Ukraine. You know, the, the Russians are very interested in keeping Ukraine uh, destabilized because they, you know, there's, we have this crazy idea that we should, or there has been at least this crazy idea, in my opinion, that that Ukraine could potentially become a NATO member. I think that would be incredibly destabilizing, and it's a really bad idea. Uh, and so the Russians keep Ukraine divided and, you know, partly occupied and destabilized so they can never become a, a, a NATO member. And then finally, with the Chinese, take a look at what they do in Taiwan, um, because they don't... <laughs> They want eventually Taiwan to become formally part of the Chinese mainland. And uh, as a result, they're always conducting operations against the Taiwanese government to see what's happening over there. So, yeah, it's um, as far as what happens in, in the West, the reason they come after us is because they want to keep our form of government in their people's eyes as being a bad idea. Like, oh, you know, we're so repressive supposedly in, 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 the, in the Russian Federation or in the, you know, in the People's Republic of China. Yet look at what they're doing in the United States. Their cities are burning. They're attacking each other. They're tearing each other apart. Uh, and yet they have, you know, there are information operations teams who are helping to fuel those sorts of things with these, you know, all these fake operations that they do. And, and unfortunately, that, that very uh, sort of information violence is encouraged and enabled by the algorithms that the social media companies operate. So you've got this perfect storm that really uh, you know, hurts everyone. Yeah. I think the sort of the first I got wind of this was when the allegations that you remember the accusation that uh, the CIA had created HIV in a lab to kill, yeah. uh, to kill the blacks. Mm -hmm. And this took off a little bit in the black community in the States, but it really took off in sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah. And I think that's been pretty definitively traced back to uh, to Russian intelligence now. I think they released it in a in an Israeli newspaper, if I recall correctly. But well, yeah, if you want to know everything about that, my my former PhD advisor, Dr. Thomas Ridd, he wrote a book called Active Measures, which I haven't read it yet. I have a copy, but I haven't read it yet. Everything else he's written has been the definitive work on that topic. So if you want to know everything about Russian uh, active measures, which are the disinformation operations that you talk about there, there and there. Um, the unfortunate thing about those operations is that there's always some sort of tangential true activity that lends credence yeah. to the conspiracy theory. You know, the sure. idea that um, vaccines were really a cover for something else, that happened in Afghanistan. You know, people um, were using the vaccine program to try to find Osama bin Laden. And as yeah. a result, now vaccines can be discredited in some parts of the world. Uh, in the United States, the... Um, I think that's why we still have polio, isn't it? Like I thought there were some border areas of Pakistan 
yeah. where we had polio basically on the ropes. We needed to vaccinate, I don't know, another million people. I'm making that yeah. up. And then the CIA got the great, brilliant idea to use that as the, the, the immunization program in like the last pocket in the world mm -hmm. where there was still fucking polio. Yeah. And to use it to track uh, uh, insurgents. Yeah. I did see... Uh, I Recently, though, that the Taliban has said that they're going to allow the UNICEF program to, that does vaccinations to operate in their country again. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that'll bleed over into not only just Afghanistan, but also into Pakistan. Um, but yeah, you've got these you've got these decisions that are made that maybe they benefit a very small group of people. We actually see this throughout cybersecurity. These decisions that benefit a very tiny group of people, but hurt almost everyone else. Uh, an example from, you know, that I'm not proud of that I know of because it's been publicly mentioned as well. Uh, at one point, the NSA subverted the patching system that Microsoft was using. And so by virtue of downloading your patches, you were getting a little NSA gift along the way as well. And when that came out, it was like, well, great, you know, that it, the NSA has been trying to help people with their cybersecurity in the West for decades. And then you find out that they subverted the Microsoft patching process. Like that's you know, really disappointing. And it was done simply to um you know get access to a hard target so uh, it's the same thing with i would argue with uh you know the the so-called enhanced interrogation program are you really going to throw away american values to, to try to get information out of uh khalid sheikh mohammed or whatever you know that certain people decided it was worth it and and yet we sort of seeded some moral uh ground there so yeah that's that's a tough situation yeah enhanced interrogation that's uh <laughs> uh I've known more than one person who's like, you know, hey, I, I really want to see what this waterboarding stuff is about. Uh, and, and of course, enhanced interrogation is more than just waterboarding, but to pick one conspicuous example. Yeah. And af after they did it, after their friends did it to them, not tied down. Right. There's At that point, there's no doubt anymore that that's torture. Like, these, these oh. are. So I have two stories about that. The first one is in one of the Krav Maga classes I taught, um, they do a form of that where you put a towel or something, you know, I can't remember exactly what it was wrapped around our head. I think it was a towel. And you're supposed to continue striking while somebody is like shooting a hose at you. Okay. And it's considered one of like the peak experiences of this particular uh, combat mindset class is what it is. And I'm remembering, I took it several years ago. So I've had a, a, a sense of what that's like and it's horrible. The second thing about the whole intense interrogation is the people who came up with that program, what they did was they took the, okay, so, you know, Americans uh, and Western as well, Canadians as well, um, were all tortured in various capacities through many of the wars in the 20th century. And as a result of that, the, um, the, one, of the, one of the outcomes was the United States creating a program called SIRI, Survival, Evasion, Resistance, and Escape. And we were taught how to deal with some of those approaches. Well, what the enhanced interrogation people did was they just took the things that were done to us and said, oh, these, this is what we're teaching people to fight against. Those must be effective ways of getting information from someone, mm -hmm. even though there's really no proof that those things work other than just to, in, you know, to cause suffering. And that's what was done to these people in Abu Ghraib and elsewhere, which is ridiculous. You know, it, there's never been any proof that torture works because basically what happens is the person will say whatever they have to say to make it stop. Uh, so the whole idea that you would get good information out of this program was a misnomer anyway, never mind all of the other horrible things about it. I was just reading about the history of the Prussian Empire, as as one does. And <laughs> uh, I think it was Frederick the Great who who changed the laws, because I think prior to him, basically evidence that hadn't been produced by torture couldn't be considered valid. Huh. I hope I'm not I hope I'm not bungling this. But basically, if, if they caught somebody who was stealing bread and he said yes i was stealing bread that's not valid it's only when they torture him and he says yes yes i was stealing bread that wow. that's then considered valid uh, uh valid testimony or valid information so i think huh. he was i think it was frederick the great it was certainly the prussian somewhere who said yeah. no 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 this is ridiculous people under torture will say anything uh yeah i mean how many uh uh in some separate reading and now i'm really tangentializing uh, <laughs> That's okay. I just read a, a, a military biography of Frederick the Great recently, um, just because I was interested. Because I'd, I'd heard that he was a defensive genius as far as military warfare went. So I thought, oh, defensive genius. What does that actually mean? Like, is that are there any parallels mm -hmm. I could use in my own work? 
And I don't consider him a defensive genius. I just consider him like he was a great commander who was attacking all the time. So I don't quite know where the defense came from. I think uh, uh, he was constantly outnumbered and having to fight uh, against many fronts simultaneously. So maybe that's where the idea of this defensive angle came from. But no, maybe he was a just survivor fighting bias. All the time. Maybe as yeah. opposed to the other 12 kings who were fighting all the time on multiple fronts and outnumbered, <laughs> who just got crushed. He, by some act of God, didn't get crushed. And now in retrospect, we assign this, uh, this genius level uh, uh, tactician, uh, strat strategician uh, award to him. Well, even the the ones who did get crushed, you know, Robert E. Lee. I live here in Virginia, which you know is Lee country, and uh, Robert E. Lee lost, and yet we had this whole idea of what's called the lost cause in um, in history, where suddenly Lee was a genius and a perfect gentleman, and uh, he was fighting for states' rights and not for slavery, despite all of the evidence you can go back and look at, and uh, that was the dominant narrative for many decades. Forget only... Russian hackers. You're going to be attacked by Virginian hackers. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, thankfully, there's been there's been a lot of pushback against that in the last few decades. Uh, I'm personally a big fan of uh, U.S. Grant, Ulysses Grant. Um, and so with the publication of all of his papers now, like 32 volumes of them, there's something for historians to work with. Mm -hmm. And so you don't just have um, the, the Southerners' works available. You've got some other material for historians to work with. So uh, yeah, that's another part of the whole history stuff I really like, the Civil War. So just as we're wrapping up, let's jump one step back to this disinformation and the sort of conspiracy fueling that's mm -hmm. going on uh, by other countries in the West, uh, by other countries doing that to the West, watching the UK, watching Australia, watching the United States, watching Canada, watching those countries tear themselves apart. What's the answer there? I mean, yeah, I, I've heard like in Latvia, for example, I think it's Latvia, there's, you know, like a television show called Russian Disinformation Today, and they'll go over like the latest things they've intercepted from the, you know, from the Russian hackers, because Latvia is again, right on that border. And, but are we going to say anything like that? What's, what's the answer? How do we disentangle this unholy alliance of disinformation, misinformation, and social media algorithms, which reward outrage. Yeah, I, I think the I think it has been definitely enabled by social media. Without social media, you would really not have this to the same extent. So uh, I watched the whistleblower testimony from Frances Haugen, the, F the Facebook employee. And I think she made a really good point that we need we need um, transparency around the algorithms that companies like Facebook use and potentially regulation of, of the way that those algorithms work. Uh, I mean, just I, I use Facebook mostly just you know, to keep track of different groups of, of uh, martial arts and that sort of thing. And yet Facebook is constantly pushing provocative videos my way, you know, outrageous this and outrageous that. And I always have to hide it. I don't want to see that stuff. And yet they always try to push it at me for me to watch. And that should there should be a way not to have that. And so clearly their algorithms uh, reward engagement because, and, and what's outrageous tends to be more engaging. And I have to constantly check myself and say, no, I'm not going to weigh in on this thing about, you know, this video that's been recycled a million times showing Bruce Lee sparring Don Anusanto and it's Bruce Lee's real fight. And, you know, 80 people have already commented on it. And I have to say, no, I'm not going to comment on this because it's the same old thing over and over again. And yet it's getting pushed to my, in, into me because it's, you know, something that the algorithms have figured out is, is controversial. So I think that is, that is a key. And I think as well, um, the policing of the content is really important. You know, when, when Trump got kicked off of, of his social media platforms, that cooled things down a lot. It's, it was amazing. And he hasn't been able to get access, you know, with his own social truth or whatever it is at this point he's trying to push. So, uh, yeah, I think, you know, there's this, there's always been this tension between the social media companies being common carriers where they're not necessarily responsible for the content unless it's truly egregious. Um, but I think we have to push back against that because it's, it's unfortunately not helping. And I think the algorithms are, are a good way to start. What about the argument that this is suppression of free speech? that this is censorship, that this is, uh, you know, somebody at Facebook enforcing their liberal values on the rest of us by, uh, by uh, deleting my tweet and putting, or by deleting my post and putting me on in Facebook jail for sharing something by, uh, I don't know, uh, 
by sharing some anti-vax thing by uh, uh, Dr. Um, Merkula. Yeah, yeah, I get it. I, you know, I, I hear that uh, you've very well covered this in, in your previous episodes. I think that starting just a simple step, and of course people say, oh, well, it's a slippery slope into hell or whatever, but I think the simple step of not pushing material that I'm not explicitly interested in. You know, I'm not in a group where these things are coming from. I don't want to see videos, whatever. And yet Facebook is trying to put this into my feed. You know, they're saying, look, look at this. Just starting there and saying, you know, you can post that stuff. That's fine. But if I didn't subscribe to it, I don't want to see it. Similarly to the way that um, Twitter is constantly forcing users to abandon sequential viewing of, of tweets mm. and instead going to what the algorithm th thinks you should see first. No, just show me the latest tweets. That's what I want. You know, I, I check in at this time and I want to see everything for the last two hours. I don't want to think, I don't want to see what your algorithm thinks I should see because it's most popular because it's causing yet another controversy. So I think that's a simple place to start. And we could, you know, we could do research and find out, yeah, what is the effect of that been? And, and if it's been sufficient to reduce the level of heat on the internet, great. If there needs to be more done, well, we can have that conversation. Okay. So how do people track what you're doing <laughs> without uh, hacking you, yeah. uh, both on the sort of martial arts research front and on the cybersecurity front? Yeah. Uh, the cybersecurity one is the easiest thing. Um, if you look for TAO security, so DAO security, uh, I'm ubiquitous with that handle everywhere. Um, even my name, you Google my name, you're probably going to find something with my books or, or, or dot security or whatever. So that's all the cybersecurity stuff. For the martial arts side, um, Martial History Team is the name of the project where we try to identify uh, and promote the best martial arts evidence and resources based on on good research. So you can Google Martial History Team and you know we're on Facebook and Twitter and uh, we have a, the blog is probably the best thing. It's just martialhistoryteam.blogspot.com. My own personal martial arts journey uh, is under the martial vitality handle. So that's ubiquitous as well. Everywhere you want to find it, it's it's there. So those are probably the easiest things. And then finally, if you're really, really specific and you just want to find out all the fake things that Bruce Lee never said, uh, there's, uh, so <laughs> there's sourcingbrucelee.blogspot.com. Um, and uh, I love that one because even the family, they'll they'll put out these things and, and you'll find, you'll do the research and you'll find out what he, Bruce Lee supposedly said actually came from an old Japanese book or it, it's Krishnamurti or whatever. And they push it like it's something he wrote and it's if he did write it it was simply because he was reading a book and he made a note of it and uh, someone saw that in the family and said oh look at this great revelation of this this philosophy and so yeah sourcing bruce lee is another uh, fun one and if i get enough content on that i'll probably just publish that as a book at some point because um there's so many outrageous things that people think he said <laughs> well i i sourcing bruce Lee .com, but i still think that fake things bruce lee never said dot com would be a better <laughs> uh, would be a better url yeah, yeah. Well, it is it is hosted at Blogspot uh, because um, Blogspot never goes away. My own my own DAO security blog has been there for eighteen years now. It's an adult. It's been around for so long. Uh, thank you, Google, for hosting that for free for so many years. Um, and uh, that's the so thing. I was, that a, I was blogger. I bet on the wrong horse. My first blog was on Blogger, not on Blogspot. I was it was a toss up which one to use. Oh, and I picked the wrong one. Oh well, Blogger and Blogspot are the same. They either merge or one acquire the other. Or, yeah, oh, okay. yeah. Yeah, so okay. you, yeah, that's fine. Your stuff is probably still out there somewhere. Well, I'll have to take a look. Yeah. Oh, right. by the way, well, I just Richard... wanted to say thank you. I have so many of these hanging around the house. This oh. is just one of them. I have the. Yeah. Uh, actually, I've got a whole bunch from here. I just gra went and grabbed your stuff. Has been really helpful, especially you know I am the I am facing the bigger, stronger opponent all the time. So uh, your stuff has been really helpful. So uh, thank you for everything you've you've done. Especially you know I tell my family about uh, you know the work you do with trying to keep people informed about COVID and everything. It's been very valuable. So you know, I appreciate that. Oh well, thank you so much, Richard. Uh, honestly, I, we could have we covered about four huge areas today. We could have spent the entire hour and a half just talking about one of those areas. So uh, thanks so much, and uh, hope to talk to you again soon. Sounds good. Thanks, Stefan. Thank <laughs> you.